So to emphasize what we think is happening here, there's a change in a biomarker that occurs before the change in clinical function or survival. And what the FDA is saying by granting accelerated approval is that they're reasonably confident that seeing the biomarker change means that we will eventually see the change in function. So because of that confidence, the biomarker change alone is enough to grant this accelerated approval. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Connecting ALS. I am your host, Jeremy Holden. In April, the FDA announced it had granted accelerated approval to Toverson for the treatment of people living with ALS tied to mutations in the SOD1 gene. This is a significant victory for the ALS community and for efforts to make ALS livable for everyone, everywhere, until we can cure it. Joining me to talk about what this means for the future of drug development is Dr. Paul Larkin, Director of Research at the ALS Association. Dr. Larkin, thanks so much for being with us this week. Thanks for having me, Jeremy. Yeah, big win for the ALS community, certainly specific for folks with U1 mutations, with Tofersen being on the market. But what are some of the implications beyond the people who are directly impacted by this approval? Yeah, I think there are two features of the Tofersen news that are particularly exciting for the research pipeline at large. And the first piece of that is that Tofersen is the first drug approved for ALS where the approval was via the FDA's accelerated approval pathway which has some really important differences from regular approval. And second is that Tofersen is the first ASO to be approved for ALS. And ASO stands for antisense oligonucleotide. And ASOs are a relatively new type of drug that have some unique features that make the potentially really powerful tools, not just for the familial ALS community, such as those benefiting or hopefully benefiting from Tofersen, but also for many other potential therapies as well. Dr. Larkin, this was the first time that an ALS drug was approved by FDA through accelerated approval. What does that mean for the future of drug development? Yeah, so accelerated approval is great for clinical development in ALS, really for exactly the reason that you'd expect, which is that it's faster. And so drugs do get to the people who need them faster. And beyond that, though, one accelerated approval in a disease can often set a precedent that allows more, though likely not all, drugs in development for that disease to get accelerated approval too. So we could be looking at acceleration across many drugs of development for ALS. And that's the short answer, but I think there are some interesting nuances in there. But to explain that, I should probably step back and talk a bit about normal approval versus accelerated approval. So a normal full approval is based on changes in how a person feels, functions, or survives. And accelerated approval, in contrast, is based on changes in a biomarker. So for ALS clinical research, we commonly use ALS FRSR as a way to try and measure how a person is functioning. In fact, the FRS in that acronym stands for functional rating scale. And that works reasonably well. It is the gold standard for clinical trials, but it does have its flaws because it can be difficult, as you imagine, to come up with one number that reflects global function for any given person with ALS when we know that the disease can vary quite a bit from person to person in terms of what functional changes they experience and when they experience them, things like that. So to get full approval, you do need to show a change in either function, like using something like ALS, FRSR, or another similar scale, or survival. And so those are the real clinical benefits that we and the FDA really want to see in the end. And it's important to point out that a person has not yet shown that real clinical benefit. Instead, it was approved because the researchers saw a change in a biomarker known as NFL, and experts in the field believe that NFL is reasonably likely to predict a change in function or survival. So to emphasize what we think is happening here, there's a change in a biomarker that occurs before the change in clinical function or survival. And what the FDA is saying by granting accelerated approval is that they're reasonably confident that seeing the biomarker change means that we will eventually see the change in function. So because of that confidence, the biomarker change alone is enough to grant this accelerated approval. Of course, despite that confidence, the FDA does want to actually see the clinical benefit to make sure it happens as expected. So they are requiring a confirmatory clinical trial. And that trial, the ATLAS trial, is ongoing and it's designed to show the clinical benefit. We really hope that it does. And of course, the accelerated approval tells you that many experts in the field and at the FDA believe that it will, but you never know for certain until you see. So it's very important to make sure that the confirmatory trial proceeds and generates this data. So 
that benefit is that the cyanide approval gets the drug to people with ALS faster. But the other thing that I mentioned is that it also sets a precedent that other drugs could be approved for ALS in the same fashion. And that's really important because once drug developers know that this type of approval is an option, they can design trials that can get them to accelerated approval faster. And because an accelerated approval trial is generally a faster and shorter trial, it's also a cheaper trial. And so faster, cheaper trials make drug development and ALS more appealing to industry in general. And that's a benefit that will be spread across a large number of therapies in development. To be clear, again, perhaps not all drugs will be able to do that, but it certainly will be a benefit for a lot of those development programs. And the conclusion there is just that more, better, faster drug development can occur if we can rely on accelerated approval. You mentioned NFL, and for folks who want to dive a little bit deeper into neurofilament light, go back and listen to our recent conversation with Dr. Tim Miller or our earlier conversation this year with Dr. Michael Benatar. Dr. Larkin, that's the accelerated approval side of things, but also some excitement around ASOs generally. What's How does this, how does the, the fact that an ASO has now been approved, what are the implications for that on the future of drug development? Yeah. So ASOs are exciting because they are a relatively fast and easy way to design a therapy that targets just one specific gene and nothing else. So compared to other ways of modulating a specific gene, it's faster using an ASO to go from an idea like, hey, I think this gene might be involved in ALS, to testing that idea in cell and animal models of the disease, and even ultimately making the big step of testing that idea in people with ALS all using essentially the same ASO technology. So ASOs are another tool that has the potential to speed up development of new therapies. And like I mentioned, ASOs aren't just for familial forms of ALS, uh, like to a first instance the therapy for ALS associated with SOD1 mutations, but there is potential to use ASOs across the spectrum of ALS. And to explain that, I should take a step back and explain what ASOs are But I don't want to go into too much detail on that in part because we have a great explainer on our website on what they are and how they work. And so I urge you to check that out if you're interested. But for this conversation, I think the most important point is that ASOs are gene targeted therapies that change the function of a specific gene. Most commonly, researchers use them to reduce the function of that gene. So in the case of Sofersen, it's an ASO that changes the function of the SOD1 gene. And it makes a lot of sense to target that particular gene because decades of research tell us that mutations in the SOD1 gene can cause ALS. And we believe that those mutations cause ALS by leading to the production of toxic proteins. So the goal is to use the ASO to a person to reduce the function of the mutated SOD1 gene because we expect that will reduce the amount of toxic protein that's produced from a mutated gene. And that should result in an improvement in health. And that sort of straightforward story exists for a couple of other genes that cause familial ALS where we think that an ASO targeting a mutated gene could reduce formation of toxic protein and improve health. So it's not surprising that there are also ASOs in development targeting other genes like C9R72, which is the most common genetic cause of ALS. But what might not be as obvious is that ASOs could well be helpful for people with ALS, where we don't even know if there is a mutated gene. And that's because there's a really interesting and rapidly developing body of research that shows that there are several genes whose function is altered in many or even most people with ALS, despite the fact that the gene itself doesn't have a mutation in it. And so importantly, some of those genes appear to contribute to the progression of the disease actively. So the idea is that an ASO targeting one of those genes could become a therapeutic for much larger population of people with ALS. And there are therapeutics like that in development. And so that's really the breadth of the potential of ASOs and once again, it's helpful that Tofersen has set a precedent as, as the first ASO approved for ALS. It's not the first ASO approved for any disease. There are a handful approved in other diseases, but approval in ALS shows that ASOs are relatively safe in people with ALS. And importantly, that ASOs can have their effects in the tissues, namely brain and spinal cord, that are most important for ALS. So while there are certainly other approaches for modulating gene function, ASOs have the potential to move much more quickly than other approaches, and the accelerated approval of Tofersen helps pave the way for more therapies like that. Yeah, I think, like you said, Dr. Larkin, more, better, faster, the way of the future, but really appreciate your time dropping by today and walking us through what we know and how it shines a light forward for us. Thanks for having me, Jeremy.
As Dr. Larkin mentioned, it's an exciting time in ALS drug development, and a lot of that excitement is centered around antisense oligonucleotides. I recently caught up with Dr. Frank Bennett, chief science officer at IONIS and a pioneer in the development of ASOs, for a deeper understanding of the technology, how we got here, and where we go next. Earlier this year, Dr. Bennett was honored with the Rainwater Prize for Outstanding Innovation in Neurodegenerative Disease Research, along with Dr. Don W. Cleveland, Chair and Distinguished Professor of Cellular and Molecular Medicine at the University of California, San Diego, and Dr. Timothy Miller, Vice Chair of Research, and David Clayson, Professor of Neurology at Washington University School of Medicine, all for their work on ASOs. Frank, thank you so much for being with us this week on Connecting ALS. Well, thank you for inviting me to speak to you. Yeah, looking forward to it. It's a topic we've been talking a bit about this year. Now, in 2019, you published an article in the Annual Review of Medicine, and you wrote that antisense oligonucleotides are coming of age. Now, before we get to that, though, I want to look back at the history of how they got to this particular age in development. So for starters, what are antisense oligonucleotides, and when did the science of ASOs begin? Yes, antisense oligonucleotides are short segments of either modified DNA or modified RNA, depending on your perspective. But they're generally 18 to or to maybe 25 to 30 at most repeating RNA DNA subunits linked together that will bind to RNA through what's called Watson-Crick base pairing, which is the, the way DNA interacts with itself. And you can design these the sequence of these antisense oligonucleotides to very selectively bind to an RNA in, in the cell. And when it binds to the RNA, it either causes it to be degraded to go away, or it may interfere with its normal metabolic function. And you can change one RNA into doing something differently than it normally does. And a splicing would be an example where you can stitch together different RNA sequences to make a different protein. And we can modulate that in a very selective manner with antisense oligonucleotides so that you can either very selectively decrease the production of a protein of interest, like SOD1, which I think we'll talk about, or you can modulate the splicing, the way these sequences are stitched together to produce a new protein. And an example of that is a drug called nusinersen that's used to treat another motor neuron disease called spinal muscular atrophy. And so there are a variety of ways you can use the elegant, the, the binding mechanism to design all of those to do a variety of things for you in cells. But the ultimate effect is that we're creating drugs that will help patients the concept of time and newness with science sometimes gets a little bit murky, but how new are we talking about? When did we first learn about ASOs? Probably the first description of ASOs as a concept happened in 1978. The issue was it was ahead of its time. The, you couldn't realistically manufacture the ASOs back then because the chemistry for doing that hadn't been invented. And so the very first paper was a real tour de force where it took a large group of people to do that experiment, but it validated the concept. And about 10 years later, eight years later, uh, the chemistry came together where it now became practical to think about how to manufacture these at scale and also how to manufacture large numbers of nucleotides. And today it's trivial to do that, but it took those two things to come together. We started as a company focused on antisense technology as a therapeutic platform in 1989. And there were several other companies that started right about the same time. So it's been around conceptually and then with companies trying to develop it for a little over 30 years now. The very first antisense product that was approved happened in 1998. And it's been slow in its development, but that, but I think we're at a point now where the technology is showing tremendous promise, in particular for neurological diseases, that we'll see a lot more products come forward. You mentioned SOD1 and the ASO's promise there. When did the technology first come to ALS research? Yes, yeah, so it's the 
interesting backstory there, but you can cut this out if you want. But this started as a collaboration between myself at Ionis and Don Cleveland at UCSD and another clinical neurologist, Richard Smith, who was locally in La Jolla as well. And Richard, we made a historical connection to Richard, and he would contact me every couple of years since we started, saying he had a great idea for how to treat ALS. And it was always not the right time. And, and finally, he, in about 2003, he contacted me and said, I have a great idea. I want you to meet Don Cleveland. And Don was he's a well-known scientist. And so I said, sure, I'd love to meet Don. And they pitched the idea of using SOD1 as a model system to validate the technology as a way to treat central nervous system diseases. And I agreed to that. And it really started based on those conversations that we started working together. And that was roughly 2003 when that happened. And so it's taken 20 years now to see the fruits of our labor actually perhaps make it to, to patients and to the market. SOD1, as many listeners are aware, affects a small percentage of people living with ALS. So meaningful for people who do have that genetic mutation and living with ALS. But what are the implications for other types of ALS? Like, what do we learn from where we are right now that maybe shows promise for other potential treatments that may be in development or maybe on the horizon? So... One of the reasons we selected SOD1 as a target to really evaluate the potential of the technology is that it was, a, at the time, a very well-validated target. We knew that patients who develop or had mutations in SOD1 were develop ALS, and the penetrance of them getting ALS was very high. So almost every patient with a mutation will develop ALS if they live long enough. And so the cause of the disease in these patients, it's, you're recognizing it's a very small percent of total ALS patients, but the cause of their disease is well known. The second point was that all the data suggests it's a gain of function mutation. And so if you remove the toxic SOD1 protein, the prediction was that it would benefit patients. And there's lots of research data that would support that in both cell culture as well as in animals that if you remove the toxic SOD1 protein, animals would do better. And, and same thing in, in some cell culture models. And so it was a validated target. We felt it was a good target to begin the process on. Recognizing it's a small percent of the total ALS patients, but it's a opportunity that we would learn very broadly what the impact of going after a disease-causative mutation would have on the disease process. And so that's how we justified going forward with this target. And the hope is that what we learned for SOD1 will translate to the broader ALS population. It would be a different drug for those patients, but we would learn a lot from that process that would translate to therapies that could be developed for sporadic ALS patients, as well as patients that have other genetic mutations. And another aspect of this is your audience knows is that the drug is being developed by our partner Biogen. And the Biogen colleagues have had a long standing interest in developing therapies for ALS. And I caught them at a vulnerable moment when they had just lost a large phase three clinical trial for ALS that turned up negative. And they were very committed to finding therapies for ALS. And really, I don't want to say depressed because the drug that they had put a lot of hopes in ended up not showing the benefit that they had hoped it would in, in ALS patients. And so I was having a conversation with their head of research, R&D, at the time. And he was expressing his frustration about the loss of the drug. And I said, why don't we go after a genetic ALS form to show that ALS is a treatable disease? And that was really another aspect of this, is that there have been a lot of disappointments in ALS. And the question is, were they the right therapy for the disease, or did we just not do the clinical trial? And so we felt that this was a good opportunity to show when we're, we have the, what we believe is the right therapy, targeting SOD1 ALS patients with a drug that lowers SOD1, that would have a tremendous, it would give us an opportunity to really determine what is the effect 
that you could achieve when you're really on to, for, for treating the disease. And I think that's played out very nicely for us. We've learned a tremendous amount from it. And this, the, the data that's been generated today does suggest that ALS is a treatable disease. It's not curative, but it's treatable. And that's a step along the way, right, to curable. I mentioned the 2019 article talking about how ASOs have come of age. What does it mean for this technology to, to be coming of age? Oh, I've spent the last 33 years of my life trying to make the technology come of age. And there's been a lot of ups and downs in, in this journey. And I think what I'm seeing now for treating neurological diseases with antisense technology, it's very gratifying. It makes it worthwhile all the time and effort we've put into this because I do believe that we're going to impact a lot of devastating neurological diseases that currently have no therapies. And it, from a career perspective, we've that's very satisfying to me. And I think we're, we haven't knocked it out of the ball, ballpark yet, but we're well on our way to having additional successes with the technology there. Yeah, a hopeful note. And I think one that I've heard from other people that we've been able to talk to this year about the technology. That being said, more work needs to be done. We're not there yet. You said haven't hit it out of the park yet. Maybe we've scored a touchdown, but we haven't won the game. Pick your sports metaphor. But what needs to happen going forward to fully recognize the promise of antisense technology? Yeah, so I, I think it's a combination of really two, multiple things. But one is we're evolving the technology to make it better and better every day. And, and so the drugs that we were working with 10 years ago are look almost antiquated compared to drugs that we have today. And it's just an evolution of the technology. And so that continue, that needs to continue to happen. Second, and this is a plug to continue to invest in basic research, is that we still need to understand the diseases that we're treating at, in, at a basic level. We think we know a lot about the disease, but there's still a lot more to learn and there's surprises that happen that we need to understand why this crisis happened. And the only way to do that is to invest in the basic research for the disease. And that will also yield additional targets that will benefit the patients. By having more shots on goal, you're going to have more chances of being successful. And I think a final aspect is that these are severe life-impacting diseases that we're speaking of. And the expectation that a single drug will cure these diseases is probably unrealistic. And really what we need to start thinking about is combinations of drugs that, that will have the ultimate benefit for the patients. And we're really in the infancy of that process, that combining drug X with drug Y and how to do that from a therapeutic perspective. But I, I really do view that's the direction we need to go, in particular for sporadic ALS patients, where there may be multiple causes of their disease and targeting a single pathway is unlikely to, to give us the benefit that we're really looking for these patients. Definitely an exciting time in ALS research and in the development of antisense technology. It strikes me, Frank, that we're talking in many ways about like proof of concept. You mentioned how in 1978, I think you said the first paper, very conceptual, and it's been a long way. What was the process like of bringing along partners and getting validators to come in and back this research, back this work? Yeah, so the Sawbone Project is actually a very good example of how partners really do help leverage what we bring and help facilitate or accelerate the development of the technology. The early research work that I was describing for SOD1 was funded to a large extent by ALZA and donations that various donors make to the ALZA organization. And the research that they supported actually enabled us to go to clinical trials with a SOD1 antisense drug. It's a different drug than Tofersen, but it was our first drug that we took into the clinic based on this concept. It really established proof of concept that we could deliver antisense drugs safely into the central nervous system. By that time, we had made significant advances in the technology and decided that it would benefit patients to stop development of the original drug and go forward with a drug that was really taking advantage of the new learnings and new designs that we had to make a better drug that would have a much higher probability of being successful at the end of the day. 
And that drug is now Tofersen. And Alza was really critical in the beginning to, to establish proof of concept and get us into the clinic. And I should say that Alza funding also had impact for other diseases that we've worked on and that a lot of the learnings that we that came out of the SOD1 project were translated to spinal muscular atrophy with Nusenersen and then Huntington's disease, Alzheimer's disease, a number of other neurological diseases really have their history that go all the way back to that early SOD1 work. Frank, really appreciate your time uh, with us this week. I want to thank my guests this week, Dr. Paul Larkin and Dr. Frank Bennett. If you liked this episode, share it with a friend. And while you're at it, please rate and view Connecting ALS wherever you listen to podcasts. It's a great way for us to connect with more listeners. Our production partner for this series is Citizen Racecar. Post-production by Alex Brower. Production management by Gabriella Montekin. Supervised by David Hoffman. That's going to do it for this week. Thanks for tuning in. We'll connect with you again soon.